when you have a wedding, as you know, on one side of the, the room is the groom's friends and families. The other side is the, the brides. And, and uh, her father was a lawyer. Her mother was in the PTA. And there were lawyers and doctors and business people on her side. On my side, they had racketeers, all kinds of drug dealers, all kinds of people with guns on them. That was the voice of my next guest, who grew up in a family of crime and ended up making millions in legitimate business. Stay tuned to learn more. Welcome back to season four of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking. It's called Custom Justice, but if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this podcast has been dedicated to interviewing people who also wrote about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame the past. Stories of hope live here. Welcome back to the show. Today I have with me an incredible guest. This man has had quite the journey. His name is John Giordano. Welcome to the show, John. Hi, everyone. I am so happy to actually get to meet you. I know we tried to record episodes before and for whatever reason, it just wasn't working out. And I think it was because we were meant to be face to face. That's the, what we Absolutely. are supposed to be. So. Absolutely. So John, um, right off the bat, I know people are going to notice that you, you have a bit of an accent. So where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Hong Kong. No, no, no. New York. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there since, well, I, I left New York. I'm actually a Floridian. Um, I left New York when I was 17 and a half. Wow. My so gosh. I just turned 77. Gosh, well, congratulations. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. I, I didn't think I was going to, I was going to make it to 17, but actually I made it to 77 so far. Yeah. So, you went through I, a lot of stuff when you were a kid. Oh yeah. So a tell lot. us, tell us a little bit about that. What was it that made you think that you weren't going to live, live to be 17? Well, let's put it this way. I'm a kid. I'm an inner city kid from the South Bronx. It was voted on Time Magazine as the worst neighborhood in the United States. It was called where there was a police station called Fort Apache. It's in the South Bronx. So we lived in uh, the projects. And um, well, I'll just go back into the whole story. If uh, you want me to tell my story, then make it easier. Yeah. Okay. So my father was. Um, uh, he sold produce, and but he also was uh, a heroin dealer. And my mother was, you know, a stay-at-home mom. My uncle was a, a hitman for some of the families. Uh, my grandfather was a Shylock. Those are people that loan you money, and if you don't, at a high interest rate. And if you don't pay, you pay one way or the other. Oof. My other uncles and, and cousins and uh, drug dealers and bank robbers and all kinds of crazy people. So if um, anybody's family thinks they're they got it rough, I'll loan your mind for a while. Let me know how you do. <laughs> my gosh, no kidding, man. You had it coming at you from every angle. Well, then my uncle threw my wedding when I was 20. And it was a really interesting wedding. I married a Jewish girl and I'm Italian, of course. And and the parents wanted her to marry a Jewish man. But they met my family. They thought they were wonderful people. <laughs> So, which they are, as long as you don't mess around with them. <laughs> don't mess with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't piss them off. Anyway, um, you know, on one side of the, uh, when you have a wedding, as you know, on one side of the uh, the room is the, the groom's friends and families. The other side is the, the brides. And, and uh, her father was a lawyer. Her mother was in the PTA. And there were lawyers and doctors and business people on her side. And on my side there, they, they had pens in their pocket. On my side, they had racketeers, all kinds of drug dealers, um, all kinds of people with guns on them. So it was that kind of diversified type of a wedding. Meanwhile, the caterer insulted my uncle in front of the family. So we killed him the next morning. And we had to leave town real quick with my new bride because the police were coming over my grandmother's house oh. looking for him. So... These are some of the things that happened. Uh, if you read the book that I have, The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up, you're going to see a whole bunch of stories. So I'll digress a little bit and go back into my childhood. When I was eight, my father got arrested and went to jail for four years. So I grew up without a dad in a time where uh, I think a boy needs a dad. 
when I was eight and a half, I got molested by some boys in the neighborhood. And um, that really messed up, messed me up really bad. When I was nine, I got molested by my babysitter. She was 14, I was nine. So that was another story. Um, as I went on, then I got into gangs. I was in a black gang, Hispanic gang, Italian gang, Irish gang. Uh, I was in all kinds of gangs. And um, I did that for a while. And then I went to, I, I wind up going into karate. I'm not going to tell you the whole karate story, but uh, we wanted to beat up the karate teacher. So we went upstairs and that was a big mistake. Anyway, <laughs> I, I joined the class and, uh, and I left the gangs. And I wind up, um, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't do drugs at that time. And um, I became a karate champion and all of this, a judo champion. And I, I focused all that, that energy in the right direction. Then as time went on, I moved to Florida and uh, I met a girl, of course. And I had this guy who was selling drugs that lived down the hall from me and he came in with a little bottle of clear liquid and I said what's that he said well that's LSD and this is 1965 right and I said oh I heard about that expands your mind and I was always interested in expanding my mind so let me see I opened the bottle I drank the whole thing oh no the guy freaked out he said those are five, though that was about five hits for five to, I was gone for about, well, about almost four days day and night flying around uh, then I started doing psychedelics. I started doing smoking pot. Uh, eventually, I gra you know, uh, gravitated towards uh, pills. And then eventually went to cocaine. And um, fast forward, uh, I became my family. I said I never would like to be like them, but I became like them. I used to sell drugs. Uh, I used to teach uh, the cartel. One of the cartels in Colombia, I used to teach their bodyguards uh, how to defend themselves and defend their, you know, the boss. Um, I did a lot of crazy stuff. I was selling guns. I was selling all kinds of stuff. Well, it sounds like and, you had an easy in with that industry. Yeah. So well, that's what happened. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I did a lot of stuff. I used to do collection work for the smugglers. If you don't pay, me and my black belts would go see you. Um, but on another, on another side of the fence, uh, I did eight plays in the theater performing arts. Uh, I wrote them, directed them, and acted in them. Uh, we had standing room. It was Kabuki theater, white face makeup with storytelling and, and music and costumes. And they were martial arts. And we put together like a young Shaolin monk wanting to be a monk and, uh, you know, going through all the trials and tribulations and, we did all of that. It's in the book, but it's a whole bunch of stories in the book about that. Uh -huh. um, then I also had my own television show that I did. This is when I got clean. Um, I used to throw the international karate championships that people from all over the world come to my karate tournaments. And this is when I was using, by the way. Oh, wow. And then um, I was uh, with the Flea Market USA. 1980, 81, right after the riots in Overtown and in, uh, in Liberty City, that's in the uh, African-American community. Nobody wanted to go into that community. They were afraid. And they opened up this flea market with 500 businesses under one roof. One of my students was one of the owners. He wanted me to buy a booth. And I said, no, I want to work for you. And he says, well, how much do you want? I told him I want 1000 a week. That is, was 1981, 80. 80. He said, 1000 a week? I said, tell you what, give me $250 a week and you tell me what you expect and I'll accomplish everything that you tell me to do. But within three months, I did everything and more. So he gave me my salary. Then they wanted to, I, I did the security and I did the marketing. And since I knew all the gangs in the area, because all my black belts were gang leaders that oh, wow. got out of the gangs and wound up going into karate. So everybody knew them. So they want to mess with us. I said, you don't mess with us. We don't go to your territory and mess with you. So that was that part of the security. Then I did the marketing for them. And I, they said they wanted that. I says, look, we need, um, 
we need something that's going to attract people back into the community. So what I want to do is I want to revitalize Liberty City in Overtown. So I went to the SBA people. We needed a theme. And I got them to help the people when they wanted to buy a booth, how to buy wholesale, how to run a business, how to do the accounting and all of that. And then I went to all the churches and all the deacons and I was dancing with everybody doing this, you know. And, um, and then I had an idea. I said, you know, I want to invite President Reagan to the flea market and show him what we're doing. So, of course, everybody laughed at me. So I wrote a letter to the White House. Two weeks later, I get a letter from the White House back. Well, it's in the book, the letter, so they can see it. Because I know nobody believes you when you tell them stuff. <laughs> right. Right? So they said, uh, due to scheduling, the president couldn't come, but was sending a representative. I and mean, as you know, before they send anybody, they're going to check you out thoroughly. Yeah. Which they did. And they sent Carrie Meeks. Now, Carrie Meeks, at the time, was a state representative, later on to become a senator. And um, she went around and she found out all the things I was doing, because that's where I taught karate in Liberty City and Overtown. Also, so I was getting the kids off the street, even though I was using drugs, you know, I was getting kids off the street, teaching them how not to use drugs. I mean, it was like a double life. Yeah. And so she went to the Martin Luther King Foundation and presented me with the Martin Luther King Award. Now, when I tell you how many people were there, and I tell you who the, the entertainer was, you'll understand. They uh, presented me the Martin Luther King Award on stage in front of 60,000 people. We had an outdoor, con I also got the pictures on the, on, on, in the book, on, you know, on the website, matter of fact, and you'll see that. Uh, on my web, John, the initial, the letter J, Jordano.com. Uh, you'll see James Brown. So we had a James Brown concert in Liberty City in a giant parking lot. And as far as your eye can see, you will see people squashed together in every direction. And, and the pictures don't even do it justice because they were all around the stage. Wow. So that's how I got the Martin Luther King Award. Oh, that's cool. Uh, then when I got into recovery, um, I then I had my own television show on Cable Tap, which was a public television. I had a call-in talk show. First, I had a half-hour show, and then uh, it was taped. And then they wanted to ask me if I wanted to do an hour show live. And I said, yeah. So I did an hour show live for five years. Oh, I had fun. senators on. I had judges on. I had police officers on. Addicts on. Homeless people on. And what we did is a show on homelessness. Uh, addiction, mental health issues, and people would call in and ask questions. And um, so I did that. I, I do a lot of stuff. That and, is amazing. That is so I only went to the ninth grade. And okay. uh, I quit school in the ninth grade. And I, I uh, when I got into recovery, I, I went to treatment. My family did an intervention on me. I told you what my family was. I'm wondering who's doing an intervention on them. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's bad if they're doing an intervention. <laughs> yeah, well, you know how bad that was, right? Yeah, you got it. So I said, okay, I'll go to treatment. I went into treatment. I thought it was baloney. I said, I wouldn't even get high with these people. What am I doing here? You know, but eventually I cleared up and I had what I call a spiritual awakening. And I tell people the story and, you know, it it, it was kind of weird what happened. You know, I'm a recovering Catholic and I call myself a recovering <laughs> Catholic. And um, I went, had this therapist who told me, he goes, John, you ever pray on your knees? I said, listen, man, I got calluses on my knees. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. Remember recovering Catholic? Remember me? I went to Catholic school. That's all they make you do is pray. All right? You pray to get off your knees is what happens. You down know, on your it, knees, up on your feet, down on your yeah, knees. You yeah, up and down, up and down. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exercise program. Anyway, <laughs> um, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, how about humility? I said, give me a break. And I didn't pay attention to him. Anyway, I wanted to, it was Christmas time, Christmas Eve. I wanted to go home to see my children, but that was baloney. I wanted to go home and get Christmas cards for my friends who would give me cocaine. Mm. So they said, no, you can't go. So I got pissed off. I don't really get angry. I got rageful. I punched the door in the room. I never even took my clothes out of my suitcase. I used to pull my clothes out of the suitcase because I was always leaving the treatment center. Anyway, I remember him telling me that I was in a lot of pain You know, I, I was off the drugs and my mind was clearing up and I started to realize how I was hurting myself and everybody else that I said I loved. Um, and, and, and what happened was I, I went to get down on my knee 
and now this may sound a little strange to the people that listen to this, but um, and I still feel the effects. I um, I couldn't get down on my knee. It wouldn't go down. And I said, this is stupid. So I, I finally pushed my knee down, and then I pushed my other knee down, and I said, God, or whatever you are out there, please take this pain away. I'll do whatever you want. And it was gone. Now, I don't know about you or anybody else out there, but a guy like me, that never happened. And it took me days to get over it. But it was gone. But as crazy as I was, I tried to get it back. It didn't come back. That's what I call my spiritual awakening, where I begin to I began to change. And I decided to get in the field of addiction treatment and help other people that were sick as I was. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. That's what keeps the show on the air. You can show support by purchasing one of my mini books or donating through PayPal or even just leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description under the guest information. As always, a portion of the proceeds of everything made do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Now back to the guest. I went back to school, got my GED, went to college. They made me the valedictorian of the of the school, uh, the addiction school. You had to have 300 hours of addiction uh, studies and 6,000 hours of supervision. So I did that. I got other degrees. I got to have a master's in NLP. And uh, I, I, and, and, well, I got so many different things. I'm an EMDR specialist. I work with trauma. Wow. I work, I'm also a chaplain for the police department. So that's even funny. Oh, about it. oh my gosh. Uh, that's cool, though. Oh, yeah, wow. I work with police officers that have been in shootings. I work with guys coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan, yeah. women that have been raped, molested, people that have traumas. So I do all that, too. And, uh, you know, I went to college, and then I opened up the book at Barry University at the time, and I looked at it. The book was about five years old. I said, it's already antiquated. By the time I get out of school, it'd be worthless. So I left school. And I decided to get a lot of certifications and a lot of different things and that I felt was really, really good types of therapy. And that's how I got all this other stuff that I got. Then um, um, a bunch of people, the mayor and a bunch of people, all the work I did in the communities, and they decided to give me a bounce a Sinai University in Jerusalem um, presented me with an uh, honorary doctorate degree. And they wanted me to go to Israel. The mayor was going to give it to me. A bunch of rabbis got together with all this stuff. and uh, I didn't want to go to Israel at the time. They're having a lot of problems. I said, look, I'm a street kid. I don't want to get killed in a foreign country. <laughs> oh, no, it's really safe. I said, good, you go. So anyway, I didn't go. And um, what happened was they did it in the shul where they had all the rabbi came from uh, Israel and they had uh, the mayor and they had a bunch of people there and they presented me with uh, humanitarian um, doctorate of humane letters. Wow. So I have a little doctorate degree now. Oh, that is so and, cool. So I, I don't know. Uh, God blessed me with many different journeys. and Oh, yeah. And then, um, I, I got into um, the psychedelics. I was against it. Now, I lecture all over the world, by the way. I, uh, here I am, the kid from the South Bronx who went to the ninth grade is lecturing to neuroscientists and psychiatrists. And uh, if you ask me how this happened, I tell you, this guy sounds like he's out to lunch. Okay, <laughs> but if this is the truth. This is what happened. Um, I was in Taipei lecturing at the neuroscience conference. I was one of the keynote speakers. Um, the stuff I lecture about, nobody's doing. Um and uh, I, I, I was lecturing, I was listening to these uh, scientists talk about ketamine and how there was an epidemic in Taipei and how it's highly addictive. And I was thinking about doing a ketamine treatment center. And uh, then after they spoke, I said, oh, I'm not going near this stuff. I don't want to create addicts. I'm trying to stop addicts from being addicts. But over the years, which is about seven years now, I, uh, I said, well, I'm reading the science, how it grows new connections in the brain. And now people that have uh, depression and anxiety treatment resistant people 
are really getting an addiction, are getting tremendous help. So my wife suffers from depression and anxiety. She's bipolar disorder. And she was having an episode. And I said, well, let me bring you to the street. I said, I met these people. They're, they're two CRNAs, uh, anesthesiologists. They really, really care about the patients. They they don't just care about the money. Which, look, money's important, but you have to first care about the client. Yeah. And um, I sent it in, she did phenomenal. And then I interviewed a lot of the people that went through there. And they all were saying the same stuff. So I said, you know what? I think I was wrong. And I went partners with them. It's the um, Ketamine Clinic, South Florida, and Pompano Beach. Wow. And uh, we opened up two more clinics, one in Miami Beach, one in Hallandale. So, and it's doing tremendous. So I added a lot of things that I learned. We do micronutrient testing to see on a cellular level where you're deficient. Uh, we do gut testing to see if you have any gut issues. We do hormone replacement. Um, all the things that are precursors for depression and anxiety, which most people don't know, People think it's just psychological. It's not. There's a medical component to this that no one in treatment is looking at. Oh, hardly anyone that I know of anyway. Yeah. Uh, if you have a low thyroid, you can have depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. If you have leaky gut syndrome, H. pylori infection, those are gut issues, you can have depression and anxiety. And I always tell people, do not believe a word I tell you. Please don't. Go look it up for yourself. Yeah. Low serotonin, a uh, low um, testosterone or high testosterone can cause depression and anxiety. Closed head injuries can cause depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and behavioral problems. Hypoglycemia, depression and anxiety. That's low blood sugar. Heavy metal toxicity can cause neurotransmission interruption, which mimics attention deficit disorder, bipolar disorder. Go look it up, guys. Okay, I'm not making this stuff up. This is not John's makeup time. Um, and I got into research. I'm part of a team of 12 universities, uh, different neuroscientists, geneticists, psychiatrists, researchers. I'm currently in 80 medical journals, uh, scientific peer-reviewed journals. Most doctors don't have one. And if you want to see what the journals really talk about, you go to my website. There's about 39 of them on there. And then you can go to a platform called ResearchGate. And ResearchGate is a platform for peer-reviewed journals, medical journals from all over the world. And it's on there. Just type my name in, and then you'll see all the, the journals. Uh, Very cool. I do a lot of stuff. Yes, you do. Uh, God, God bless me with connections with that are unbelievable. Uh, I work with Dr. Blum. He's the geneticist who found the primary addiction gene called the DRD2 ALE1 variant gene. And that's the main gene. There's a bunch of other genes that go with it. Now, we also have what is known as the GARS test, the genetic addiction risk score test, to see if you have a mild, moderate, or severe propensity for addiction. And um, we can give you amino acid therapy. And we have about, I don't know, about 15 studies, peer-reviewed studies on that, how they upregulate dopamine. So there is a lot of stuff out there that people don't know about. Um, NAD plus. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Are you familiar with that, Amanda? NAD? No. Look it up. NAD plus is an enzyme that we manufacture ourselves. Okay. But as we get older, it diminishes like everything else. Mm -hmm. And what that does, it's the fuel for your mitochondria, for your engine that actually runs all your cells in your body. Oh, wow. Oh, it works with, helps with depression and anxiety, and it also gives you energy and helps to repair your cells. Now, there's another thing that the body has that most people don't know about. It's called zombie cells. Go look it up, guys. I know you're going to think I'm making things up, so to please go look it up. Zombie cells are cells that don't totally die. And what happens with that is it clogs up the works it can cause cancer and a lot of other things in your body. So they use senolyticals with fiestin, F-I-E-S-T-I-N, quinescentin. These are neurotropics that can help you clear your body through defecation and urination, get it out of your body. So, and then you do chelation for heavy metals with EDTA. Uh, that's another chemical that they use to molecule to grab a hold of the heavy metals and take it out of your body. 
and it's done through an IV. Wow. And there's other ways to do it, but we, I don't want to waste all this time going into all this stuff. <laughs> but uh, those are the things we do. So what happened was, I um, you, you got to read the book. I don't want to tell you the whole story, but uh, I went partners with my, with my uh, I had no money. I was homeless when I started. I got divorced. Uh, my wife got the house, the car, the boat, you know, whatever. Oh. And uh, we didn't have a boat. I had a car. <laughs> house. You know? Anyway, I wind up um, living in my friend's hotel. He, he loaned me a room. Somebody loaned me a bicycle. I had a job when I used to put quarters in. When I had quarters and I was teaching karate. I uh, had to make money enough to eat and do things. And I came up with some ideas and I raised some money and I I opened up a treatment center. Now, the only thing I knew about treatment that I was in one. I knew nothing about treatment, of course, except that I was a patient. Anyway, I got this famous doctor. He went in and my therapist, I, I brought all the people that helped me. And um, long story short, I got cheated out of my treatment center because they didn't like the fact that their client was uh, their boss. So mm -hmm. that happened, but I had to stay there and swallow my pride, swallow all that. It's a long story. And um, I almost had my uncle come down and kill him, but I changed my mind. Uh, yeah, oh, it, yeah, it got really hairy. Read the book, guys. You'll see. Yeah. Speaking then, of your book, have you got that handy? Have you? Yeah, got I got that little thing handy. But let me just finish the storyline so yeah. they understand what I'm saying. So anyway, uh, I opened up my own treatment center, long term, short by myself, and I started mm -hmm. it with three hundred dollars because I didn't have any money. And my friend owned the building. It was a level 750 square foot building. Um, and by that time, I had my my CAP, was a certified addiction professional, and I can you know do outpatient treatment and all this kind of stuff. And um, I started with that. I had creditors chasing me. I had no money. I it was like crazy. But we started to build up. I got one of my friends, and he went partners with me. Then got his son and. Over time, we got a reputation and we started doing treatment like nobody was doing. We used hyperbaric medicine, oxygen under pressure to heal the brain. We were doing amino acid therapy, acupuncture, neurofeedback, biofeedback, uh, amino acid therapy. We were checking the gut. We were checking uh, the body for nutrient deficiencies. Uh, we were doing colonics. We were doing lymphatic massage, getting drugs out on a cellular level. We were doing sound and light therapy. Nobody, and they, they still don't do hardly anything of the things. We took them to the gym. We had an organic restaurant. We were feeding them protein drinks. And I mean, it was over the top. Wow. And that happened over years, by the way. It didn't happen right away. Right. And um, so I started with $300. And in 2012, we sold it for $45 million. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we were doing 36 to $40 million a year. Wow. Now, that's from, from $300. So all the people used to laugh at me when I started, you know, and now they ask me, uh, they want to hire me as their consultant. You know, we had nine vans, we had an organic restaurant, we had a spa, We, I mean, we had everything. It was wild. So um, now I can read um, this little excerpt from my book. I wrote this book. I I wanted to make sure that people realize that no matter what kind of family you have, no matter what happens to you growing up, uh, no matter what school you went to, you can be successful. And not only monetarily, but internally. Addicts, addicts are not human beings, they're human doings. Oh, you know, okay? that is such a beautiful way to put it. And what the problem is, is that most addicts that I know are very smart. Um, they have a skill set that they don't even realize they have. They're tenacious. They went to any lens to get their drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they very highly manipulate those and it takes intelligence to manipulate all the things that they do. You know, uh, all these skill sets, they were very disciplined and going and getting and doing. Okay. So that's a skill set. They could take that, you could put it anywhere. Right. And they were tenacious. And they were, you know, they they, they were compliant even. <laughs> Everyone will look at it that way. 
<laughs> okay? So these are skill sets that you can just take and put it in a good direction. So I wrote this book to help people to show them, hey, I became vulnerable. I want to show them that, well, I'll read about it. It's, the book is called The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. Here's my roadmap for positive change. There is one thing in this world, one special lesson, one constant that has guided me through the turbulent waters of life. This infinite rule, which most people know, but ignore, or who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the obstacles, the people that get in our way, or things that slow us down, follow this one simple rule. Never give up on your dreams, never let go of your passions, and especially never give up on yourself or God of your understanding. My name is John Giordano, and I am a recovering addict who turned $300 into $45 million. I was blessed to become extremely successful, and I'd like to share my story with you. This is how my life was transformed and how I was saved from falling into the abyss of hell and by following this one rule and learning how to have a life worth living. And that's my little excerpt for those out there who think things are bad and they're terrible. I, the podcast asked me once, John, what would you change in your life to make it better? I said, my life is already better and I wouldn't change one thing because everything that happened to me got me to where I am today. That's absolutely beautiful. And John, we've got maybe two and a half minutes left, but I want to make sure that we end this on a very beautiful note. And you are such a powerful speaker that I know you're going to come up with a good answer to this one. It's my favorite question every time, always. What is one thing that you truly love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? One thing that I truly love about myself, that I became a better human being. And I'm still on that journey because I also have a lot of work to do. Work is ongoing. You don't just go to the gym for a month and think you're going to be in shape for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff shows up. And I just keep open-minded, guys. Never give up on yourself. And when you're not feeling good, go get help. There's no shame in that game. Know what I learned in life? I know I don't know. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to the other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com.